good afternoon. I'm here to talk to you about how we can rethink the way that we light our urban environment at night. The way that we can make cities better places for people after dark. And you might find that a little strange coming from someone that deals with electric lighting every day or every night uh, of, my, of my life. And you might find it even stranger as I talk you through this that my suggestion is that we use less light and that we, we take into consideration the natural qualities of darkness that still, thankfully, remain in cities like Sydney. Now, I want to start with a photograph of Trafalgar Square in London. It's full of people, one of the busiest places in central London at night. And yet, if you take out a light meter, it's less than moonlight. Yet people seem to get on, they feel safe, they feel secure, the ambience is nice, it's a great place to be. And I want to expand upon that a little more later in my talk. But before that, I want to set some context, because I know some of you are thinking is, what, what's a lighting architect? What does a lighting architect do? Well, I quite literally am an architect who works with the medium of light. I work with other architects, with interior designers, with landscape designers, with artists, with other creative individuals to light both private and public space, both externally and internally. So lighting architects work on projects like this. This is the Copenhagen Opera House. And here, the idea was that the interior lighting should create the identity for the building after dark. There is no external lighting. The entire, uh, the entire image and identity of this building is created through carefully designing the interior lighting. Or for projects like this. This is the Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque in Abu Dhabi. Here, it's all about stories, about the narrative of the moon and its relationship to stories of, within Islam. And th those textures that you can see on the marble facade are actually projections of cloud patterns, as if clouds are passing over the face of the moon. And as the moon wanes over the month, the building becomes ever bluer, ever darker, telling that lunar story. And sometimes, lighting architects work with reinterpretation. So here is a project, an 800-meter-long disused coking plant in the Ruhr Valley in Germany that was turned into a nocturnal park for the local community. The reflecting pool was part of the lighting idea, the rusty red light creating, hopefully, some sense of poetry. So you see, lighting architects are very lucky. We get to work on all sorts of amazing scales of buildings, lighting the interiors of fantastic historical buildings such as St. Paul's in London, or small and beautiful interventions such as John Pawson's Sackler Crossing at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew. And sometimes we just work on simple, low-cost, low-energy community schemes such as the Maggie Center, a drop-in cancer care center, again, in the heart of London. Now, at the heart of what we do as lighting architects, though, is that we also work in cities. We devise master plans, master plans that plan the lighting out for whole cities, for city center areas, for neighborhoods, and for parts of cities, for individual community districts. And sometimes that's just as simple as creating some lighting for people to go about their business safely, to go from A to B. But sometimes it's to do with using, I hope, real sensitivity to make familiar places really pleasant for people to use at night. Now, this story, my passion about light and darkness in the city, I want to start in, a, I guess, a curious way by turning to two Americans to inventors, inventors that reshaped society and reshaped the world. On the left, Henry Ford, and on the right, Thomas Edison. Two inventors that brought us the motor car and electric lighting. In a way, two inventions now that certainly we're beginning to question in terms of the environmental impact they create. And I obviously want to talk about one of those, the invention of Thomas Edison, but it's kind of handy that they were friends because Henry Ford produced this fantastic quote. And that got me thinking, if Thomas Edison heard that quote from, from Henry, 
What would he have thought that we wanted from his invention? right now in the 21st century. Well, I can tell you what we don't want. This is a wonderful photograph taken by my friend Jim Richardson at National Geographic of light pollution over Chicago. It's a wonderful photograph, but it's of a terrible thing. It's a crashing waste of energy. It's ridiculous. We don't need to do this. And Chicago is typical of so many cities, um, so many cities around the world that have created terrible problems of light pollution. I also suspect that Thomas wouldn't imagine that we wanted this. This is another kind of pollution. It's visual pollution. I'm not saying we shouldn't have any of this in our cities. You know, celebration, vibrancy, a bit of life and color does nobody any harm. But this is a sort of visual pollution that is creeping in throughout our cities. You know, you see it everywhere. I've seen it here uh, in Sydney. It's there. It's something that is growing. But of course, Edison also knew we didn't want this. This is a photograph of New York after Superstorm Sandy. And I spoke to people from New York about what it was like when the lights went out in New York, and they were plunged back to pre-electric civilization. And everybody I spoke to said it became a pretty terrifying place. So it goes without saying that none of my proposition to use less light in the city or to create this idea of dark city is suggesting that we go back to this situation, rest assured. Now, I think what Edison would have been surprised by is, in the last hundred years, the sort of cultural significance of lighting within our cities and how the lighting kind of echoes or reflects uh, the city in question. And I can best illustrate this by showing you some of those sort of classic views as you fly into cities, famous cities, uh, at night. And here, in London, this wonderful image taken by Jason Hawkes. Here in London, we find a situation where we have a typical London scene. Very piecemeal, rich, diverse, nice bit of lighting there, terrible bit of lighting there, bit of brightness, bit of darkness, bit wacky, bit creative, very unplanned, bit freeform, very London. <laughs> Whereas we travel to Paris, Paris the self-proclaimed city of light. And we find the strongly lit and organized boulevards, the dark rooftops, the relative absence of any lit signage, and one big lighting statement, the lighting of the Eiffel Tower. And then we move to Hong Kong. We move to Hong Kong, and we find ourselves in a situation where the density of light speaks volumes about the city of Hong Kong. And then we come to a city like Bergen, where people live in darkness during part of the year for the greatest period of time, and we find it's the darkest city. Now, it's technology that drives the lighting within our cities. And when we used to sort of burn stuff, whether it be wax or tallow or oil or gas, we were very limited as to what we could do. But then Edison came along, and he gave us what seemed to be freely available and widely accessible electric light, such to the point we take it for granted. We put on a light in a room, and if it doesn't come on, we notice it. We expect to get electric light. And as a result, we've gone absolutely mad for this stuff. We've filled our cities with light. But now we're in the midst of a technological revolution with light-emitting diodes, digital control systems, presence detectors, all sorts of manners that enable us to use light in a much more interactive and responsible way, that we can use lighting smartly. And that gives us an opportunity for the first time in our history to really realize that we can achieve sustainable lighting development. Lighting development that recognizes the social benefits of the light. We all love to gather around the campfire. You know, we are not nocturnally adapted. We are diurnal creatures. We like to interact with each other in the street. We also can realize some of the economic benefits of light. And this is absolutely critical to realize, that the economic benefits of light are fundamental to the modern city. I certainly know in the UK, the nighttime economy is now worth 70 billion pounds, and that is not to be sneezed at. But we know that all of this comes with a warning. We fill our skies with light pollution. We 
create over-illumination on a ridiculous scale. Now, I'm not um, having a go at Gap here. This could be any store in any city in any, in, 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 or in any town. But it's so unnecessary that the shop front is lighting the street. And what we absolutely know is, for sure, the impact that artificial lighting is having on biodiversity within our cities, on bird migration, on all sorts of flora and fauna creating all sorts of problems. But at the same time, we know we have an intrinsic fear of the dark. You know, I don't want to meet this fellow on the street, and neither do I want to go down this dark alley. So I'm not proposing that we use darkness in this kind of way. But I am very fearful, because if we're filling our cities with light too much now, if we were, and it's a silly analogy, all given a light bulb when we were born, and that's our light bulb for life, just by dint of the population explosion in the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to have a whole lot more light. And what is really important to understand is that there are places in the world that don't have enough light. Light poverty is a real issue in developing countries, in emerging economies. So we have to share this light energy around a little better and be a bit more responsible. For you see, we should see a view of the stars, not just because it keeps astronomers happy, and I like to keep astronomers happy, but because it reminds us that we live on a planet. It's part of our natural existence. Darkness can bring us certain things in our city. It can bring privacy. It can bring silence. It can bring qualities of intimacy. Concealment is not always a bad thing. We have as much of a right to be concealed as we do to be seen. And if we get this noise down, if we reduce the background level of lighting in our cities, if we can just get it under control, then we can create real magic through the light that we use. Magic for people to enjoy cities after dark. So I finish again with Trafalgar Square, with this plea, with this rethink, coming from a person that uses light and darkness as part of their work, that now is time to change. And if I ask Thomas Edison whether he agreed with this proposal, I have a feeling that he would think that it can work. Thank you very much.